Great. So, it's an afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Wonderful. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here to talk to you about um, uh, creative problem solving. It's uh, uh, a joy to be able to talk about the subject with folks who um, have the level of interest in it that you do. So, it's really great to be here. Um, what I'd like to do is to um, set the stage for what we're going to do uh, for the next hour or so. And I will be. Um, Talking without a microphone, can you hear me in the back of the room okay? Yeah. Comfortable with that? Great. Um, the focus is going to be on the, um, the history of creative problem solving, the developments that took place along the way, uh, the current status of the method, of the approach, uh, and what's in store for the future? What are some of the things that we're thinking about? Because, um, at least from my own perspective, from the uh, looking at um, the work that's been done over the years and uh, the work that we have in store for the future. It's um, one of those versions of creative thinking and problem solving that we think get pretty close to kind of functioning as, if you will, the, the software for the mind. You've heard those kind of analogies before. But it's kind of the operating system. And so we want to talk about how that creation of creative problem solving has come to be because that has implications for where it needs to go in the future. And so we'll set the stage on that. But I'm going to do that in a way where I'm just going to kind of do a, a brief on um, the history, current, uh, and future in order to kind of set the stage for a platform because I'd like to move into conversation and take the conversation where you'd like it to go in the form of questions. Because I know um, for some of you in particular have been uh, in the Michael program, you've um, seen some of the, the things that we'll be talking about. So I'd like to be able to extend beyond that as well by going where your questions are. So set that stage uh, for about a half an hour or so, and then we'll get into some questions. Okay, so be thinking about questions along the way, but please feel free to ask questions um, along the way as well. You don't have to wait till the end. Okay, uh, as Neil mentioned, uh, my background is in um, creative problem solving from Buffalo, New York. Um, anybody been to Buffalo? Buffalo, a couple of you. Um, yeah, I moved to Buffalo in 1986 to um, enter the master's program. Is that working? Yeah, this is, we've got Alex has been... Um, oh, he's been covered. Covered. Alex has been <laughs> updated. Where's <laughs> okay. the man? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ah, thank you very much. That, that is Alex. Um, so we have a long history and a long tradition um, in thinking about um, creativity, and that's mainly because of um, Alex Osborne, who... Um, was a really profound, uh, we call him a reflective practitioner. Someone who's very, very interested in the practical application of creative thinking and problem solving, um, but who's also very interested in understanding the theory and the background, the methods and the models associated with understanding how it all works. Um, and so it's because of Alex that uh, this tradition of creative problem solving was born in, in, um, in Buffalo, New York, back in the early 40s. And so we'll... Um, set the stage by positioning everything we're going to be talking about stemming from the work that Alex did uh, as part of the part of the history. And um, so that is, yeah, that's Buffalo. There's not always snow on the ground, so if you've heard some of those rumors, uh, it's not totally true. But um, what's at the foundation of it and what made Alex really set the stage well as a reflective practitioner was he was interested in both theory and practice. And that's what's underneath the surface of everything we're going to be talking about, is what is the theory, why, and what's the practice, how. And so we've been able to um, keep his vision alive because we've had a foot on both of those platforms, if you will, the theory and the practice. So a lot of what you'll see is the integration of both of those. Starting as far back as um, in 26, where um, he's very interested, but you have um, Graham Wallace talking about how do creative people work and studying Helmholtz and Poincaré and so him reflecting in the 20s about trying to understand what is it that makes people creative when they when they think and problem solve, um, solve problems that's in the 20s it goes back a lot further than that you know you can go back to Aristotle and Plato and you know thousands of years ago where they were thinking about thinking and how do we understand all of that so we're trying to build on and Alex reflected on this but even further back uh, in, in India you know, 400 years ago. So even Alex back in the 40s is standing on the shoulders of some pretty profound um, thinkers uh, in the field of thinking and problem solving. 
But it starts with um, this, you know, preparation, incubation, illumination, verification as the fundamental platform, getting explicit and deliberate about the creative process. And um, you may have uh, come across, there are many different methods. We're going to talk about creative problem solving, but there are a lot of methods available out there in the world. And if you um, take a real deep look at the methods, they all have some very fundamental elements that are in common because they all root back to this kind of a basic understanding of process. So whether it's you know, design thinking or uh, innovation processes or you know, creative problem, Kepner, Trago, Synecdoche, there's so many methods out there, but they all come back to this fundamental understanding about how the human mind works when it's engaging in creative thinking and problem solving. They're all very powerful interpretations of what um, Wall was talking about uh, back some time ago in the study of highly creative people. So what we've been able to do is to try to unpack it, best practice, understand it, uh, research it, figure out why it works, and then try to communicate it to others. That's a lot of what the tr tradition has been about, and that's what Alex was about. So Osborne, his goal was to try to make that creative process explicit, deliberate, and repeatable. Now, you know, um, Alex was part of um, BBDNO, advertising agency, like a billion dollars last year. I mean, big, big company. But if you've heard the, the story, the reason he got interested in things like creative problem solving and eventually brainstorming was because they hired, he hired in his advertising company, the best and the brightest and the most creative people to do advertising, right? But um, something happened when they sat around a table. It was like their creative IQ went to zero. Something happened. And it was the social interaction of creativity in the form of people that shut it down. So brainstorming was one of the first things he invented to help deal with that. But it was a very practical reason. How do I help my people help this company grow and be more successful at what it's trying to do? So it was a very practical reason that Alex moved into this whole, whole field. So he invents things like this, but then he has bigger vision. And that's what's really cool about um, the work that he started was his vision was to bring in more creative trend to American education. That's where he started. So how do we bring creativity into the education because it wasn't there. Uh, we did a lot of facts and figures type things, but to teach thinking wasn't part of it, especially creative thinking. So he starts that way in the most popular book. This is where he really popularized brainstorming. Um, so you got Alex starting it out. What he does is he creates version one. If you're familiar with the current version we're at is 6.1. This was the first conception of creative problem solving. Has anybody seen this? Right? The very first conception of what is creative problem solving. And what do you notice about it? I'm going to ask you some questions, by the way. What do you notice about this version? Sequential. What's that? Sequential. Very sequential. How do you know it's sequential? It's got numbers. Once you put numbers on stuff, right, it takes on an order. It takes on a sequence. It prescribes sequence. Um, so absolutely. But a lot of it is about, you know, what are we going to work on? Let's come up with some stuff, and then let's evaluate the stuff. But when we come up with the stuff, and stuff's a technical term, but... When you come up with this stuff, <laughs> separate it from when you analyze it. Because Alex's belief was that people already knew how to analyze. They were already good at that. But we had to help them come up with better stuff, especially in that social reality where creative people got together. So a lot of his original thinking was about helping people figure out what it is we're going to work on, but then generate it and then evaluate it. Uh, and so the judgment, ultimately. But even he had some thinking that changed over time. That was in his first... Um, publication of Applied Imagination in 53. Um, in 63, 10 years later, this is his version of Creative Problem Solving. Okay. What do you notice about this one? Fact finding, idea finding, and solution finding. I didn't do that. <laughs> so how, what do you notice on this one? Subtle changes. What's that? Still sequential, absolutely. What else do you know? Less numbers. Less numbers. There are less numbers. Hold on to that thought. So now we're from seven to three. Has the period process gotten shorter? <laughs> good. But you notice he's got solution now. Evaluation is one thing, but solution sends a different message. What does the message of solution, what message does that send? Action. Action, right? Something's going to happen that's going to solve something as opposed <laughs> to just evaluate. It's a different concept. So now he's thinking about that. Go ahead. I mean, he starts at the third word is, is this problem. Yeah. So of course if you start with a problem, yeah. you find a solution. 
Right. And nobody wants a problem, right? It has that negative connotation, get it off me, right? So you got that, right? So yeah, he's now in fact, which the problem definition is in there, but he's got facts. Let's figure out, right? And then so let's understand that, and then let's make something happen. Ideas are always there. That's always his home base, helping people come up with the ideas. But so he's added that the fact stuff behind it, and then making sure something happens with it. He's added some different um, slant on things, which is fascinating. Um, so he, even he's changing his thinking about uh, what creative problem solving looks like. And then you've got, um, remember, his vision is a creative trend to American education. So now he's going to try to teach others how to engage in this deliberate, explicit process. So how do you do that? What do you have to think about to make it teachable to others, right? And so he teams up with someone called Sid Parnes. And what Sid um, is interested in is, is that education side. So he teams up with Sid, and Sid, uh, preparing for the educational program, Sid comes along and says, um, okay, let's tweak it a bit. So now we're at version two. Right, what do you notice about this version? No, 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 no. Still got numbers. <laughs> Seems to me, he sort of, he, I get the impression he's trying to make it more and more cut and dry because the thing that's either missing or has been elided from the earlier version is this mysterious incubation step. The step that says, go away and do something completely different and wait for the idea to drop into your mind. And I get the sense that he's trying to make this more acceptable for people who don't really like that sort of thing. Yeah, this incubation is not that apparent in here, is it? Because Alex, when he originally set it up, was you generate, you stop, you put it down for a bit, then you evaluate, which gave the opportunity for incubation to kick in in order to have the evaluation be a better evaluation. That's not as visible here, is it? It's more the steps you take, the deliberate action. As so opposed trying to, to make it more acceptable to a big hierarchically organized corporate, which is my take on it. And it's, yeah, the proactive, got to get something done, it's becoming a lot of doing. Right? That's in there as well. And partly because now we're going to teach it. What are we, we're going to teach somebody to incubate? <laughs> Which, yes, you can. Paul Torres did a whole incubation model. It's incredible. The father of creativity in the, in the U.S. side of things. Over 2,000 publications on creativity, Paul Torres. Whole thing about incubation. But you're right, not present here. Not present here. But there is a change here. What do you notice about this one? <laughs> yeah, what, what, so what's this thing about? Uh, is he saying that... Um, Best option is not necessarily the option that should be put forward in terms of acceptance, as long as it works. Is it right? So, regardless of the quality of the solution, are people going to buy it? Are they going to accept it? It's the next layer. Having a great solution doesn't mean people are going to just take it and run with it, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're starting to get explicit. We're moving from problem solving to making change. That's one of the shifts that's starting to happen. When you start getting into this, it's more than just analyzing and evaluating or generating and evaluating. But now it's about, does that make an actual difference for someone? Because we were assuming that. Right? That's the reason we did it. We're running a company, right? You're batting bottom dressing in Osborne. You've got to make a real change happen. But now we're getting explicit about the method to make that change happen. So it starts to broaden a bit, which is neat. So you start to see that now we get the five stage version. That's version two. All right, then we do this project. Wait a minute. We got this cool method. Does it actually work? Can you actually teach people to increase their creative capacity? Can you actually do it? Can you teach someone to be creative? Right. Minor question. Right. We built this lovely framework. Supposed to help us do that, but does it actually work? Biggest project ever done to uh, answer the question was called the Creative Studies Project in the early 70s. National Research Foundation, everybody got involved, big, big stuff. Um, and massive amount, and the overwhelming evidence, absolutely. You can actually teach someone to be more creative. Can you? I mean, is it, what does that really mean? We actually teach people to be more creative to have more creativity, or was it to use more of the creativity they've got? Does this teach you what work, or is it nurture, or is it discover, or...? Release, Elaborate. channel, it's those kinds of things. That's really what's going on. Because we know from all, I mean, at the International Center, there are over 200 measures of creativity on file, 267 when I was there. Measures of creativity. 
no one ever scored a zero under those measures. So everybody's got it, right? It may look different for different people. The question is, how do you release that in a way that enables it to come out to a higher level? And there was tons of evidence to support that. Through methods and tools and environment and space and all of that, you can do things to help people use more of what they've got. Overwhelming evidence. So we don't have to answer that question, but we've got massive amounts of evidence for it. So we know we can do that. So then, um, all right, so we can answer the question, can you teach it? But now the question is, how do you help people use it? Because this is Scott and Don. And Scott and Don were um, students, uh, Scott was in particular, of Sid Parnas. And Sid was a master facilitator. He could use fair problem solving like you wouldn't believe. And he would always like a cat. You throw a cat up in the air, they always land on their feet. That was Sid. He would always land on his feet, no matter how difficult the, the issue was. The wicked problem, didn't matter. He always landed on his feet. He was really good at it. Was, well, Scott in particular was like, see, how are you that good? What, what are you doing? Because Sid was doing a lot of stuff in his head beyond those five steps. So we had to start unpacking that. What made him so good? Because remember, we're trying to teach others. How do you help others increase their capacity to use that method uh, in the context of creating change? So they had something called mess finding. And then this becomes version three. So now we're building on, this is the tradition, we're building on Osborne Parnes, now you've got a Saxing and Treffinger. That's the visual. What do you notice about this visual? Uh, is that another word for seeing that some degree of chaos is what you start with? The word mess? Yeah. Yeah. Forward to some sort of yeah. Literally, people would say it's really messy. They use those phrases. This is a real mess. What a mess that we got ourselves in. They literally use that word. This ambiguous, fuzzy, confusing, complicated situation we were in. And so what they did was they put on the front end, because remember, we've already dealt with the back end, making stuff happen. So now it's the front end. What do I have to know on the front end? Because a lot of this problem solving gets initiated by frustration and emotions. So how do we figure that out? And that's what they put into what we call mess finding, to understand and sort out all that complexity. Things like ownership and orientation and outlook into the situation, a bunch of stuff buried in there. But what else do you notice about the system? What's missing now? There's no numbers. We got rid of the numbers. <laughs> However, when you look at the visual, what does the visual say? It still says pretty much sequence, doesn't it? Right? Now, and so it logically makes sense that, you know, if you're going to, you know, solve a, if you're going to get ideas, you have to know what the problem is, and you have the problem first, you come up with some ideas, and you have to have ideas to build solutions. And so logically, it makes sense that there is this logical structure and flow, right? And so it was still showing up in the, in the visuals as late as 1985. Um, so that's what's going on. But you remember the, what Alex talked about around this generating and focusing. You come up with stuff and evaluate it. We're now starting to put it into the visuals. We're now starting to say, hey, look, there's a visual. You come up with stuff and then you evaluate it. So we're trying to better reflect what Alex's original thinking was. Right? So now at least we're trying to get that into the visuals in 85. So we've dealt with a little bit of the front end, we've got a little bit of the back end, because CPS is moving from, the, from a problem-solving method to a change method. It's growing in that direction. All right, so now that happens, but as we said, it still looks pretty linear. You drop your problem in the top and clank, 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 out the bottom comes the solution and change happens. Does it always really happen that way? Is that in real life or is that theory? It's a conceptual model. And so we got to do something about this now, because when they had the Creative Studies Project, we found that a lot of people were leaving the program. They weren't interested in the program. One, because it, the process looked very linear and very structured, and for some people that was like a straight jacket. Imagine creativity like that. And some people like, ah. And um, others were saying most of the, the tools that were in the program were very generating oriented, trying to help people come up with stuff. But a lot of creative people already do that naturally. They need help with focusing. Right? Convergence. It was not a balanced toolkit. So now we have to solve that problem to make sure CPS has the balance of coming up with stuff and evaluating it, generating and focusing, diverging and converging, whatever language we want to use. But we also have to deal with this issue. And so um, based on a whole bunch of studies, uh, we break up the process. And now we make it look like this. 
okay? So we use little traffic light symbols in the US, red, yellow, green. So we, um, we came across this because back in the, um, in the early 90s, this is, uh, yeah, 92, we were working with folks inside of companies. Again, think practice. And um, we train them as facilitators. They're working in the company. We come back a couple months later, check in, and we say, so how's it going? And they say, well, we have to apologize. We're not using CPS anymore. Oh, why not? What's going on? So we ask them questions. And they say, well, really, we're only using parts of it. What do you mean parts of it? Well, you know, sometimes we, we spend some time up here trying to figure out what they have to work on. And then we're done. Or sometimes, you know, they come to us with an idea, and we got to figure out, how do I get that to work? And that's what they were saying to us. That's what people were, were saying to us about the use side. So we said, okay, it may be it's more componential. So we started to cluster the stages into components. So we had, this was about understanding, and this was about clarity, and this was about action. Understanding the challenge. And so we broke it apart. All right. It still looks pretty linear, but it's version four. At least now we've got components to better reflect what people were actually doing to apply it in, in effective ways. So that's going on. Now we break it, but we have to break it even further because this was on a poster. And um, it was this nice, neat poster. And um, one day during a staff meeting at the, at the center where we were all working, Scott and Don are having, having an argument with each other. And Scott takes out the poster. You may have heard this story. He takes out this poster from CPS and takes out a pen. So that's not the way it works. He says, people are doing this. And he drew on the poster with a pen. It's like the icons like that at CPS. You know? And he drew on pen. Pen doesn't erase. There was literally a gasp in the air. We all went, because he just literally went, oh my God. Uh, and so we really have to go after this notion of, if we're going to seriously change it, what does it change into? And so version four has to go a little bit further. So we really break it apart. And we start even talking about components by themselves. You know, you can actually depict them independently of each other. That was like a big shift at the time. Uh, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. But then eventually, if we can use these as individual pieces, the question then becomes, what's the correct order? What's the correct sequence to use them in? Remember that it makes sense logically that they kind of flow? In real life, what's the correct order? What's the correct sequence that these get used in? We know that, any order. In real life, logically it makes sense, but in real life, out there in the world, it's more of a menu than it is a prescription. And we started to, we had to unpack that quite a bit because we had to make a fundamental decision because this is very different. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Remember the first, the second one, the third one, one, two. There's a lot of methods that have prescriptions. And we didn't have enough information to be able to prescribe this because all we could look at was to describe what happens in real life. What happens in real life depends. So we made a fundamental decision with CPS to go descriptive, to describe the creative process, steps, components, stages, and tools rather than to prescribe them. We don't have enough information to prescribe. Not yet anyways. So we went this route, and um, that's one of the things to think, whenever you come across methods, there are pluses and minuses to every method on the planet, including CPS. So as you're looking into other methods as part of your journey, you're looking at whether they prescribe or describe. For us, the philosophy and the approach and the strategy for us is to say, let's describe it, and then let you determine how to use it. That's what we decided to do with, with Creator Problem Solving, but that was a, kind of a big shift for us. And so now the methods, when we think about CPS, we start looking at how do we communicate it as a descriptive model rather than a prescriptive one. So now we start talking about names of components and symbols to communicate with, because now we have to communicate it differently, that there's no particular order or sequence that it has to be used in. In fact, a lot of the, um, the way we talk about CPS came from a research project that looked at how people naturally solve problems. Again, now we're trying to be reflective practitioners. Uh, as well as researchers. And so we do a study that looks at how do effective people solve problems? What's the process? What does it look like? And these are um, summary examples of the character of those processes. Some people in their heads, remember this is the way people think, in their heads, this is the way they think. Very clear, right? Pathway start to finish, logic and reasoning very visible. That's the way some folks problem solve. And some problem solve this way. 
This is what goes on in their heads. Right? Multiple start points, multiple end points, the linearity not so clear. Right? So what happens when this person and that person try to work together? You've probably seen it You've, from your own experiences, right? And then you got folks in the middle maybe trying to bridge a little bit because they got some of the character of this and some of the character of that. So we, what the original versions of CPS, who did they fit with? Who were they more natural for? Right here. So turn it this way, turn it that way, it doesn't matter. That's what one through seven, one through five fit very naturally for them. These folks are going straight jacket, not working for me. <laughs> so our challenge with CPS was how do we communicate CPS in a way that would fit? the full spectrum of people. Because you're trying to reflect human creative process, not just some of the human's creative process. That kind of a challenge we had. Uh, and then just try to train it and communicate it, etc. Here's another way to look at CPS. Right. Clarity, ideas, and action. The natural needs associated with it. Right. Do I have to have one need in a certain order, certain sequence? Not at all. Again, it's quite descriptive. But we know there's some needs around action, there's some needs around ideas, and there's some needs around clarity. So, what again is the correct order? What's the correct? How do we communicate that in the form of a visual around CPS? So we got Greg's help. Um, we looked at the relationship of the process itself, what it looks like, in the context of also all those things that will affect the actual sequence that it is used in. So you know what's trying to be accomplished, the people that are involved, and the best approach to take all come together to affect what it's actually going to look like when you use it. And so we had to make sure the visual enabled us to take this information into consideration. And so what we did was we created this version. This is version 5. All right, this is uh, uh, later on in the year in 1992. So at least, you know, where do you start? Where's the start on that? <coughs> Whatever seems most appropriate. We're trying to move in that direction, right? Because that's the way it should be. Because your reality may be different than someone else's reality, so I need to help you and help them. So we're trying to set it up so that um, it'll fit to what the need is. And we bucketed around the three basic needs, clarity, ideas, and action. So now we're trying to communicate this way. Now if I want to, right, I can do that. I can go through all three in sequence, or I can just enter. Either way is gonna work for whatever kind of preference someone has. That's still very much around the process itself. Um, so I get involved in the, uh, in the early 90s, uh, we start. Yeah, I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> that on. The um, those folks inside that company that I was talking about, who um, um, were saying we're only using part of the process, they would also say things to us like, "My God, I wish we had a halfway decent client," <laughs> because they got this really cool method. But as soon as they brought it to a client, they was like, "Oh my God, please help us." They were like begging us to help them in some way. So literally in the back of the training room with the folks, um, I'm on the back table, Scott comes over, and we start drawing some mechanism to help them figure out, how do I say no? I guess it's a great method, but should I apply it? It's not appropriate for everything. No one method is not an elixir, right? How, how do I say no? How do I say not yet? How do I say rather than just you, can I talk to so-and-so? Because they have to play as well. Because if we're trying to make change now, we're not trying to just run a good session, we're trying to make actual change. And that's a people issue. It's a lot of other issues, not just having good method. So we started to take all those ingredients, all the things they would tell us that would influence their ability to use it, and we organized it into our, the original um, task appraisal. Where we said, okay, what are all the people issues and the context issues, that place you're trying to build? What is the place like? What's going on? Is ready, willing, and able to support change? Tell me about the nature of the change you're trying to make. And then I can think about the appropriateness of the method. Again, CPS is only one. There are many methods out there. But at least it was a diagnostic tool we could give them as a mechanism to say, okay, this will help me find a halfway decent client. Because now I can say, mm, can I talk to someone else? So we built that as a mechanism, again, back to practice. We're trying to help people practice it better. But it's conceptually organized. We'll talk about that in a bit as well. Now we um, frame it up. Right now, it's outside the method. Eventually, we weave it into CPS. It becomes part of CPS in 94, the diagnostic. That's another thing to look for in methods. Whatever method you're exploring and learning about, do they have the ability to diagnose before they're applied or as part of the application? So, so 
so would you say that that class cooperation is the mess that the facilitator finds himself in, not the mess the client is in? I think it's a combination of both, actually. Right? Because if um, for us the philosophy is that um, facilitation process serves content. So me as facilitator, meaning process, I serve you as content leader. So if you're in a mess, so am I. I can't design process until I have to sort out the mess. Task appraisal is designed to do that, is to sort out all the pieces. Because what we find also, you may have chatted about this in some of your conversations, that the perception, you know, what is a facilitator? Do we all have the same understanding of what a facilitator is? Right? And so if they call me in to be helpful, sometimes a facilitator is, is really a content expert. And that's the perception. So if you call me in as a content expert, but I'm saying, no, I'm a process person, that's part of the mess we got to sort out. So my role, your role, our roles all have to be played out, uh, figured out prior to stepping in and actually trying to make a difference. This was designed to help with that. So if there is a starting place, it's here. What do we need to know before I go in and help? This by itself can be an intervention for many, many clients as well. Just by asking questions, you help people shape their thinking, clarify stuff. It's pretty powerful by itself, but it's also part of the, the system. The analogy we use on this is, if you think about this as computer software, you may have heard that. Um, this is like Microsoft Excel. This is PageMaker, or Excel, PowerPoint, and uh, Word. So three pieces of software. How do you know which software to use? Depending on what you need. Depending on what you need. That's this. This helps you figure out what software to use. This is like the operating system in the computer. It's always on. So it's always on. You're constantly making decisions about this based on what you learn and relearn here. It's always on. Okay. It's a thinking framework. In fact, a, a colleague of ours, uh, Andy and Kate, um, uh, works inside of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, one of their partners. And he used to talk about, um, as a partner in a consulting firm, a pretty successful one, his whole point was you never open your mouth until you've done a task appraisal. Because every time you speak, it's an intervention. That was his philosophy. So it's always on. It's a thinking model. It's a thinking framework. We use it very implicitly as well as explicitly when we're designing the use of CPS. So that we built it right into the system, and then we uh, tighten it up a little bit. Today, what it looks like is you've probably seen it something like this. This is greater problem solving, current reality. All right. So again, the components are there, the stages are there, the generating, the focusing, we're trying to capture all the essence. It's a holistic look into what's. Uh, needed to be paid attention to, and then decisions get made based on what we learn. Okay, so the diagnostic is built into the system. And that's what today's look like. So when you unpack, um, it's the people, it's the context, the method, that's what task appraisal is. You have to know this information to make a good decision about what parts of the system do I need now. And so it's built in. Go ahead. Yeah. So are you saying that if you have that as a template and you put in all the variables, and you hit enter, that uh, a certain number of options will come up. In other words, is this, so in a way, this is a substitute for stupid people. If you just can't do it in your head and come up with something like that, you can then use a template, put in all the variables, and you it's like a spell check. You could be as smart as someone who doesn't need a spell check, but you could be a good speller. For this one, we use it as, in the way, yeah, what you're talking about, from a diagnostics perspective. What are all those things I need to plug in in order to answer the question, should I use CPS to help me? That's what this is, right? And it's funny because you have in a training setting, if you ask everyone, you know, what would you want to know before you decide whether to help someone? And in a group, a group of people may get questions in all four, but individuals don't frequently get all four categories identified in their questions. So you're right, it is a way to remind all of us about being, <coughs> being holistic and understanding what we have to pay attention to in order to make the best decision about how to help someone. Well, I'm not even saying that. I'm saying, you know, sometimes you can just come up with things. <coughs> you just do. If you're a creative person, you can come up with solutions like that. If you're not a creative person or semi-creative, if you put the template in, I guess you improve your batting average by 50 or 60%. Yep. So it's like a spell check. Yeah. There are people who can't spell, yeah. but they can pass now an essay and get an A or a B because there's a spell check. Yeah, in a way, yeah, it helps them. I position it probably more like a uh, something that I can lean on to help 
channel my imagination in a way that adds value. That kind of thing. So yeah, it's a mechanism to help me. Creative imagination. Cre exactly. Creative <laughs> imagination. Absolutely. Applied imagination, Osborne. Absolutely. It's a system to help me apply it systemically and yeah. systematically. Uh, after this lecture, I feel like uh, does, the task appraisal is more like a tool to empower the client. Okay, it's a learning point for the facilitator, but you empower the client to take the change, to think on a bigger change. Yeah, because this, you're right, this goes beyond just running a session, doesn't it? This is about really making some change happen. When you start asking these kind of questions, it's about making a difference, not just running a meeting. Because the question is like, you know, what is the result you're looking for? The real result. And so when we can do this, now we're more likely to move it beyond just coming up with stuff and, and evaluating this stuff. We can now look at it as, what's it going to take? What do I have to understand here in order to figure out, can I actually make the change that I want? That's why we call it an innovation and change framework. Because this allows you to look bigger than just one piece of the puzzle. It lets you go much larger and more systemic in making real change happen. Without that, it's actually quite tough. How do you gain consensus on the understanding of who the people are involved and what the situation is? It's a good question. Um, how do you gain consensus on that? Um, we start with the person who's asking us. So you go, hello, you know, we have a conversation. But when we start to explore this, then we probe. And when we probe in here, who else has decision-making responsibility? You start asking questions about the role and the responsibilities related to the task, they start mentioning other people's names, then we go there and we say they have to be involved in this conversation because we can't make the real change you're looking for until we engage them up front. And so it's, it's, if they're interested in making the real change, they, they have to involve those folks up in front. If they choose not to, it means they're not really interested in that. So you have to let go of this and scope it to where they do have interest. And that's the stuff only that they can do. So we, we expand and contract the task to fit whoever's in the room. And if they won't bring the other people in, then we have to shrink the task to fit them. Because if we contract for this, but we can't talk to these people, only this person, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So either we do this, or we get more people in the room. That's what this allows us to do. Do you use formal personality assessment processes, like Herman or DISC or MBTI? Um, we use something called VIEW. Um, but we have used, in the, uh, we also use climate assessments, so we'll do assessments here, we'll do assessments here. We did that once for a project with Tyvek, if you're familiar with Tyvek, Federal Express Envelope, she's, I don't know if you see them over here, they wrap houses in Tyvek now, with, it's like a strange cloth paper. And so we, yeah, we did a six month task appraisal with them where we did actual assessments on the climate and where is the organization ready to accept the change we wanted to produce, your personality stuff using view or previous measure like it. In order to understand that, and then we went in and, and worked on it, and they recapitalized with three hundred and fifty million dollars, and they they now have Tyvek and whole new places like house wrappings and all kinds of other things. But yeah, it, it can be this, or it can be a conversation in a in a pub. Very <laughs> We've had both. So, just miss, what do you say you use for the assessment for the context and climate? We wanted to understand. Um, how ready the organization would be to accept the change they wanted to make. And what this does is, um, the assessment we use is called the Situation Outlook Questionnaire, and it looks at nine dimensions of creative climate, and those dimensions tell you how healthy is the organization, mm -hmm. and therefore how ready is it to accept the change we have in mind. And they had a very, very, very healthy climate, so they absorbed it. In fact, during the, idea, during the session, we did framing the problem, we were doing idea generation, I had the owner of the business in my group, before my group was done, it was a three-day meeting. We were a day and a half in, my group left. Because they came up with an idea during the session. It was, they got so excited about making Tyvax smart paper that they dismantled my group and they sent everyone to stop construction on buildings so they could build a new capacity to make Tyvax. We weren't even done. So they were, I mean, that was this and this. They weren't even done and they were out making change and for the right reason. So you could see the results of the assessment really were real. Pretty exciting to see. Uh, and then decision making around how do you know, you know, scope, what's the scope I'm trying to involve, what parts of CPS, as we said, and is it, you know, is it a two hour thing we're trying to plan or is it a two year kind of thing we're trying to plan? You know, 
now we can scale it, scope it and scale it depending on size. Again, it's, you can see the change flavors kicked in and we've got tools to enable the mechanisms and the guidelines Alex talked about and decision making about how do you know which tools to use. So that's there. But if you look to the future a little bit, um, this is what we see to be some of the, the it's about professionalizing CPS. We, we're pretty confident that the framework seems to be working. Um, in fact, we are very confident it's working. We took a, did a six-year hiatus between 94 and 2000 to, to do the research, is it working? And we changed some of the language, but this, the basic frame is working. And so we're less concerned about the frame. It's now about how you do other things with it, uh, whether it's uh, further tailoring it, enhancing the day-to-day -day side of it, um, expanding the application beyond product, because there's still a lot of product focus, like producing stuff. And that's important, but there's other things that can be done as well. Uh, moving from a mindset of a workshop to more about outcome, you know, to real change type things, and then um, really standardizing and recognizing the skill sets, accreditation, those kinds of things. Those are big. I mean, just for, for example, the first one is this. Anybody familiar with this? Four P's. You've seen this before, right? This is sixty thousand foot view. This is theory. Right? We know any learning system on the planet. Any application system, any organization has those four ingredients operating all simultaneously. You can't get rid of them. They're all there, all the time. The question is, do we want to manage them? So if we're going to think about anything related to making change happen, we have to think about the whole system or we're just not as ready to manage the change. And so that system is theory, fits to the question of what works best for whom, under what circumstances. We need to learn more about that so we can inform the decision making we make about the use of things. Right? So what works best for whom, under what circumstances. So the research has to help us unpack that. But then that research of what works best for whom, under what circumstances, has to feed the practice. Theory and practice have to stay aligned. That's what makes CPS a little different, which is kind of exciting for us. They align so we can personalize the journey through. Everyone has their own journey. If I can make some better decisions about my way through, it makes it that much more effective. So personalizing its application. The day-to-day -day leadership stuff is not in all situations. You know, we talk a lot about facilitator being a different person than the client, like we've been having that conversation here. But the day-to-day -day reality inside organizations, it's often the same person. So we have to be thinking about how do we take CPS and do a better job with enabling a someone who's in a content leadership role use process in their day-to-day -day work. So they become thinking frameworks that someone who's managing others can actually use to facilitate that work without taking out you know flip charts, post-its, and markers and things like that. Or if they have to, how do I do that? Because right now we talk a lot about separating those. So how do we leave them together and then enable people to do that on a day-to-day -day basis? That we gotta figure out as well. Um, expanding the application beyond product, as we said. Um, this, by the way, this is uh, um, Scott and Don's input as well. We had a conversation with three of us around looking into the future. What are some of the things we need to think about? What works best for whom? Under what circumstances is the research laid? We've got to keep the research going. And then on the practical side, I'm going after things beyond just product. Um, we're relationship building. I mean, I mean, I know. I want to get into politics, but you, know, you can look at in the U.S. anyways, we got a lot of politics stuff going on and not everyone's getting along with each other and all that kind of stuff. I mean, going after some meaty big issues around relationship building and sustaining and technology is growing faster than we can handle sometimes. How do we harness that in new and useful ways, harnessing it and making it add value uh, to society? The diversity stuff um, and how do we use, because CPS is a collaboration framework. It's one of the things that does really well because it's so close to human, human thinking and problem solving. So how do we help it to, to go after some of the big issues around diversity that we're dealing with? And then meaningful and, and purposeful application of it on, in, um, on topics uh, for betterment of all. I mean, examples of it, uh, lost prizes. Is anybody familiar with Ken McCluskey's work? A really neat book called Lost Prizes. And this is about um, kids who are at-risk kids and um, in trouble with the law, thrown in jail, stuff like that. And they use creative problem solving to help them redefine themselves in a way. And this is one of the kids, I mean, he turns out to be an unbelievable artist. And that's what he's doing right now. But it's, it's taking and um, applying it to, to kids and helping them not get in trouble with the law. 
things like that. Um, transforming directors, you know, from groups of people into teams. And so what's the product outcome? Is a team functioning at a higher level. And so we use it uh, for those kinds of situations. Or vision and mission and values and structures. So it's the soft sides of systems inside organizations. Um, it's not just about you know, the products we produce, which is a lot of where it was originally invented, some of the original thinking. So we're broadening its application to individuals, groups, and organizations. And then um, the mindset, as we said, from workshop to outcome. Are there ex great examples where, I mean, I'm on a project right now, this thing with the Coast Guard, we're using greater problem solving to set national standards for the United States in, uh, when it comes to recreational boating. So if you go through a recreational boating course in the United States and you want to learn how to operate a power boat, a sailboat, or a human propelled boat, craft, what are the skills you should be able to demonstrate as a result of going through an entry level course, a beginner level course? We're trying to get the nation to agree on that. And we keep it a small task, but we're getting there. We just officially got approved in um, November, uh, the power standard. So now if anyone's gonna build a course in the, anywhere in the United States, these are the fundamental skills that they need to build into the course to keep people safe on the water because it's about safety. So back to the whole safety and environment. This is safety in the environment of being on the water in the United States. Right? So we're doing that for other things. And there are other examples as well, but it's, it's large sale scope where we're not just planning meetings, we're actually planning change inside of, uh, inside of groups and organizations in that case, in that country. And then recognizing and standardizing. There are a few places that um, actually give credentials for creative problem solving, creativity, things like that. We need to, if we're going to professionalize it, we have to really make more of that happen. So people understand that this, it's like you can get a degree in accounting, you know, and then how popular that is. It'd be great if you could do something like that with um, creativity and make that something that is focused, whether it's a core capability that cuts across or its own area, um, it's, that's got to happen if we're going to professionalize it to the next layer. Okay. So those are just some of the kind of the thinking points around, uh, around the future. Lay in the landscape a little bit, greater problem solving, current version. Okay. So that's a brief history of where we've been, where we are, and where we're thinking about going as a result of um, the history. So let me open up to uh, some other questions. You asked some questions uh, along the way. But what other questions do you have? I want to take the conversation to where you'd like um, to go. Yeah. Inform decision making. Yeah. The ancient Persians used to make significant decisions twice. One strong, one strong. Who did that? How do we put it into that bit? Too mindful. There was some research done on um, on the effects of alcohol and creativity back in the 60s in the United States. <laughs> All the research that the China Creative Leadership did. And they found after 18 ounces of beer, you actually were more creative. Two beers. Significant decline in the greater performance, and that's true. That's and they did it with some drugs and other things too. Three goes back. What's eight comes back? Three goes back. Yeah. Even higher than it was. No. So, but you look at some research. Same thing with deprivation tanks and things like that. As well. Okay, but how do we put the two mind state of making a decision into practice in a company? How do we say, look, you know, we are informed. We're going to make a decision. Let's make it twice. Yeah. What do we do that in practice? Yeah. And you can actually get very explicit about that. Um, the way we did it with CPS is a very concrete example. We did uh, something called an evaluation matrix where I spent a day just identifying criteria with the senior leadership team. Just criteria a day. They had um, nine product concepts they wanted to spend money on. 75 page business case after underneath each one of them. 20 people in a room in Germany doing this big matrix, you know, three days. And when it was all done, being this real scientific approach to stuff, Kate and I were there for this. Um, at the very end, we said, okay, let's use your, um, your, um, <coughs> your intuition dots. You know, we had to make some very heavy analytical decisions. And then we said, let's also bring in your gut. We had them use the gut as well. So it was kind of like two rounds of very analytical and the gut. And they use both of those to make the final decisions. So we just designed this process to literally have two rounds of decision making on. You can get that explicit about it. But what we find is the more, the less option you give to make choice, the higher perceived value the options go. So they get less risky. 
So they just did all the analytical stuff, so they were more playful when they applied their gut. So it allowed a different climate in their heads to make that second recommended decision. You can design process quite explicitly about that. I think that's why Alex separated generator from focusing, because it was two different mindsets associated with it. Some of the reasons, sorry, hand here. I just wanted to ask if you've had um, the experience of, of using this framework for community groups or sort of civil society organizations <coughs> where the product is not necessarily, you know, kind of a business outcome, but it's much more around maybe social capital or what have you. Um, so I'd just be interested to hear about that particular population. Uh, it's a good question. Um, you've done it like non-profit organizations, probably the... Um, Closest to that, at least for me, would be probably the Coast Guard work, because it's not an organizational application, it's standards that everyone will be able to apply, whether it's me, myself, and I learning and teaching my son, or someone else um, you know, running a school, that kind of thing. So that's probably the closest that I've had uh, in that kind of context. Um, nonprofit work of like future in our hands and things like that, but still organizational. That tends to be our home base. So not as much for myself, but Don and Scott have been into some of those environments. Done with churches and church groups and things like that. Very effective there. But they find the problems are quite consistent across the topics that they work on. What about the seven railroad? What are you doing with the seven seven railroad? Actually, can I involve Andy in that question? The Severn Railroad? Sure. Also, um, I'm, <laughs> asked, I'm looking at my colleague, Nikki, who's actually the person who's driven most of it. Um, Seven Valley Railway uh, in headlines, um, they, um, as a, as a uh, not-for-profit, they have to turn around the railway, uh, an engine, in a certain period of time. It has to have a certain maintenance on it, and we've been working with them for three years yeah. to drastically reduce how long it takes to turn around an engine. So we're kind of working in the boiler shop with the guys, literally, who kind of take these things apart and applying CPS and actually enabling them to then apply CPS themselves. So they've reduced the timeline from two years down to 100 days. We were 600 days down to 200 days. 600 to days. That, that's the headline. There's a lot more to it. But. I see. But I mean, what the, the problem was simply one of time and efficiency, I guess. Uh, yeah, they. Uh, you, if you take 600 days, there, there are certain regulatory um, times they have to service those engines by, and they only have a certain amount of stock, spare engines. So they don't get it in that time, you have no trains on the line. With no trains on the line, you have no heritage railway. And that heritage railway accounts for about £10 billion pounds in the ecosystem. In our seven value railway. That's not just their revenue, that's the whole ecosystem that depends on it. So they don't get those trains on the line, they're not running and working. There is no ecosystem. So. Did you need a, uh, a problem-solving system to figure all that out? They did. Well, they did. They, they needed. They needed. We've cross-trained them. Uh, if you see the pressure release or anything, it's we've, we've enabled them to do it themselves. We we're very clear about that. We helped them um, enable themselves. Yeah, they needed the same system here to figure out what are the core challenges, how are we going to address this, how are we going to make this happen? In a repeatable, explicit, and deliberate way. And when you go there, explicit, deliberate, and repeatable, oftentimes what you get is that efficiency. The impact research we have on CPS, years of doing it, is things take about one third the time, and you usually get at least twice the productivity in that time. And so 600 down to 200 is very consistent. That would be an interesting story for me to follow up. Sure. Uh, I either talk to <coughs> Nikki, she's an engineer. Yeah, I'm very interested in that. Yeah, yeah, I'm interested in that. There's a hand over here. I'll put that in. Yeah, you mentioned at the beginning this sort of SID and the importance of his facilitation technique. And I know, having used some of this, that facilitation is pretty important. How important would you say it is, having come up with the process, Independent of facilitator, depending on what the um, the what's going on. Yeah. If it's, for example, group application, yeah. facilitation is incredibly important yeah. because the method is just a method. Yeah. There's no magic to a method. It's how that method comes to life. Yeah. And all three roles, client and facilitator and resource group, 
have to, it's, um, it's, it's not a magic thing, so therefore it's as good as the people in the room. It can help them bring their skills and their talents out um, in a way as a collaboration framework that you get more from that group than you would from its parts, that whole thing. Um, but yeah, the role of facilitator in a group application is very, very, very important. It's critical. Um, and that's why we've got a fundamental skill set that we try to unpack with folks and we train around it. Um, and for us, facilitation um, works when you have something you're facilitating. Mm -hmm. And so that's why for us, facilitation involves process as well. So the framework is what the facilitator facilitates. And so I know there are other approaches to facilitation where it's generic facilitation and it's more like managing group dynamics, which is important because we have that in as well for us. That's important as well. But yeah, it's, it's very important. The, the framework is just the framework. So it's, how, it's in the hands of the people using it that make the difference. There was a hand here and then over there. Yeah, I wonder if you have any tips you could share on a good way to use this within a classroom <clears throat> kind of setting to help our students go through this process in a fairly small amount of time and, and a fairly, fairly focused task. Do you have any tips for using it in a classroom? How much time are you talking about? In my personal class, I have a total of 10, 10 class sessions, not very much time. But, uh, but other people will have different things. It's not a huge amount of time. No, 10 weeks and about 40 minute classes? Uh, no, no, a little bit longer. A little bit longer than that? Okay. This has been broken down and put into a uh, class structure. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, some of the original work we did teaching at the master's program in, at Buffalo designed that way. We typically do it um, uh, in stage and phase. So, stage being those six particular stages uh, and the phase generating and focusing. And so, we'll typically do it in chunks like that. Uh, broken down over time um, and then what we do is we make sure that um, it's the logical flow so you want to show them the logical flow the pieces where it makes sense logically you have to end it with something that shows them the descriptive nature of it because can you all make one of these have you all made one of these before you all made one of these can you make one of these make sure your fingers are nice and straight have you done that before they've all done this somehow okay so if you make one of these well, don't be shy, it makes things nice and straight. And if you were to put it right on your chin, those of you who haven't done this before might think this is their chin. Oh my gosh. Okay, no worries. So when you've done it before, say, I'm not going to put it on my chin. Right. So, right, remember, most of the communication we send is non verbal. Right, this is not my chin. It is my chin. But what do most people pay attention to, as we know, Right, depending on the research, the Ravens research, others, most of the communication we send is nonverbal. So if you teach it linearly, they're going to think it's a linear process. That was the problem we had. That's why we had to break it up. We said one thing, but all the visuals said something else. And it wasn't working for most of the folks, or at least half of the folks. So show them something at the end that allows them to break it apart into pieces. So well, pieces and then break it apart. Just the additional piece for the latest question, maybe some links to Don and some of the materials yeah. you want to check in with us later on. Yeah, we can do that. Don, we'll connect you with Don Treffinger. Don is, the, of the three of us, Don is taking all of this and brought it to the education world. Uh, and Scott and I have been taking it to the, to the business world. So we collaborate together to build stuff and then we test it. That's one of the ways, ways we test it, is take it into two different environments and then go back together and talk about it. Okay, there's a hand here and then we'll go there. Go. Yeah, picking up on your point about messy situations with lots of different interests, um, in them, uh, I used to a colleague of mine on games and simulations uh, with very often inventing fictitious communities, chimes across a little bit to Matt's point and so forth. And I kind of recognise that as a similar kind of framework that, that, that we've been using uh, with whatever props. We use very similar <coughs> props and so forth. And so on and so forth. And it's not so much about getting a specific outcome, but it's trying to get people into a framework of thinking about stuff and build some relationships in that and see who emerges and so forth. I just wondered if you'd seen any crossover there. Um, I haven't seen it personally, but from what you're describing, I can see a, a very big connection because what we're trying to keep, the reason it's still labeled the way it is and the way we talk about it is we're trying to keep this to be a thinking framework. So if you're trying to help with thinking frameworks, this should overlay quite nicely on what you're trying to do if some of that thinking involves decision-making, problem-solving, and, and creative thinking. This should lay down right on top of it because it comes from there. And gaming is a great place to see that play out. Uh, we do it with sports. We're using this in the sports world. We're starting to chat about that. 
you know, if I'm a tennis player, how do I, what problems do I have to solve as a tennis player? In an average match, a typical tennis player is going to make 900 decisions in one tennis match. So how do we help with that decision making using the game of tennis? So it would be fascinating to unpack this, to see how it's actually playing out in that environment. You could do some great statistical work on that, some, some great um, <coughs> studies on that. But I would, I would suggest, I would think they would lay over very nicely on top. I'm trying to keep this as close to the human software system in the head as we can. And that's what hopefully will help it transfer to a variety of contexts, including gaming. Uh, from the 4P uh, theories that you mentioned, like, uh, my question is from people. So if we see like people as um, like a different personality, like a view test and say things about them, like um, divergent thinking and convergent thinking, uh, from your experience, what do you think? Do you think To help them cope yeah. and flex rather than accentuate what they might do naturally. Okay. Yeah. yeah. From my experience, my personal thought is um, it comes down to the nature of what someone's being asked to do to contribute. And I know from a creative standpoint, from a creativity perspective, we have to be able to do both. We have to be able to have the alternatives and, and analyze those that we have. That is that energy system inside the whole creative process. Coming up with, and so for me, I think it's important to make sure that both people can do both. How about we, we just create a process that we just put some people in the first, like you know, first part, and we put, put some people that are, like, you know, they are it's in the, their nature, in the process that they just make decision, like decision making, and the generation, right. so they just separate. Yeah, and it's possible. It, uh, it's possible. There's implications when you get into organizational structure. When that happens, Michael Curtin used to talk about that a lot. You know, Michael Curtin's work in England, organizational psychologist. But if you put the natural ideators up front, and they're doing some of the work up front, so they might be in, a, let's say it's R&D, then you get into um, manufacturing, you know, then distribution, those kinds of things, where it has to move through the whole system. If this set of folks is disconnected from those folks, if that's an entirely different set of people, the handoff becomes a major problem. And so when you separate them out like that, you create a barrier here, and these usually have a certain personality. On the view system we use, they tend to be explorers, and here they tend to be developers, and we know the natural tension that exists between those persons. Right? So if we don't do something to engage that, they will create something, and the handoff will be like this. All right, we built it, go! <laughs> and that's the handoff. Right? And so we gotta, what we typically recommend is you gotta have at least some overlap and someone is going to drive it through this. There's some other things that have to be considered rather than just specializing in the thinking. Otherwise, from an organizational standpoint, it will break down. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Mike, my question is also about the four Bs when you mentioned what works best for who under what circumstances. Um, does that mean that an individual entering the process, let's say in generating ideas, could implement tools that are not for that particular um, stage, but for um, another stage, such as preparing for action. I'm, I'm trying to understand the effect need has on, um, you know, making tools that people use effective, whether or not they are appropriate for that stage. Right. Um, yeah, this, ultimately, for example, the, the only place we have prescriptive research is in idea generation tools. So let's go there. Stan Griskevich, 1981, in London, does some research on teachers, and he's learned some things about visual identifier relationships and brain writing will produce certain kinds of ideas. VIR tends to produce radical, uh, revolutionary, brain uh, writing, evolutionary. So I can choose now, based on the outcome, what kind of outcome do I want, I can choose what tool is going to be more likely to deliver it. 
So that's the outcome influencing the process, right? But if I happen to be a developer, VIR is gonna be probably in that coping side for me. So now I have my personalities affecting the appropriate tool to use for that need. So then how do I modify VIR to fit for me as a developer? I still want it to function to produce the revolutionary change, but I wanna do it in a way that helps me use the tool because it may not be as natural for me. So now I'm thinking about how do I modify the tool to get that outcome given my personality? That's what we're trying to figure out in that area. And that's gonna be for all four of those Ps. That kind of interaction's happening <coughs> all over. We know explorers love idea generation. Developers tend to get more excited about action, right? So how do you help a, an explorer do the action and help? Do, and so it's what works best for him. And some of that's because of the nature of the tools we have. You know, but a lot of the tools we have in focusing tend to be developer-oriented. So what explorer-oriented focusing tools do we have? Um, Not so many. So we're going to fill up the toolbox. That's those kinds of things we need to put in. Okay. I think I have to probably turn it back yeah, on. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm aware that... Uh, let's go for one more. Oh, can I ask a question? Oh, you're teasing me now. I'm aware that we are standing between mince pies, mulled pie, and lunch and Christmas shopping. Probably in that order. I don't know. So, but Brian's going to be around afterwards. We're going to have this lunch outside with drinks and so on. So, Brian will be around until half two, I think. Three. Three, even three. So, if you can hang around, there's lots of chances to ask questions and have one on ones. We hope to keep people around for at least the next hour then. And uh, I just want to thank Brian for a fascinating. <laughs>